Good evening. Good evening. How y'all doing? Stay warm today? Yeah. It's chilly. Uh, there's quite the spread back there today. Uh, we had our circuit meeting here that, that we hosted, and so some of that's left over from that. Others, others have brought, uh, have at it. This is the holiday season. <laughs> yeah. So today is. I know I always say this. It's an interesting day of what we'll cover. Uh, tonight we're going to start our study of the Antichrist. And yes, I said start. Uh, there's going to be a lot to cover there. Um, be our. Before that, we're going to do something uh, with that worksheet. If you still have that worksheet, great. If you need one, uh, there should be copies left over there. Just keep in mind there's two sheets per. Hey, them like, looks like Heather's grabbing them out. So two sheets, remember? Well, just one more. <laughs> Those on the live stream that can all be found online on our midweek study worksheets. You can see the comments every week. I, I post the link for those. Right, let's begin with prayer. Holy Spirit, we once again ask for your blessing upon our study of your word. You have inspired this word. Lord, as has been very clear as we've been going through it. We thank you for that, and we ask that you open and enlighten our minds, especially our hearts and souls, to the truths that we will once again look at tonight. Bless our review, and also continue to be with us as we grow in acknowledgement of the times we live in and of what's to come. We ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. All right, we'll go right to the, the worksheet, then the, the review of the seven. So remember last week we wrapped up the seven bowls, which ends our sevens. Doesn't end the divisions, of course, but ends the seven groupings that we see. Uh, the seven seals, let's just kind of go right into it. We saw that in chapters, chapters basically six and seven, but especially, you know, are also a little bit beginning of chapter eight. Uh, We'll go through this pretty quickly. So as you come as you come to something, feel free to shout out the answer. Uh, 
as we kind of just remind ourselves what each thing was. Uh, the first seal, what was the imagery? White horse. Uh, meaning, remember that? Yeah, most likely the spread of the gospel. Again, what era are we talking about in Revelation mostly? The New Testament period. So here's the spread of the gospel. Go and make disciples of all nations. Second seal. Red horse, meaning? Yeah, warfare, bloodshed, things like that. Third seal. Black horse, meaning? Famine, pestilence. Uh, fourth seal. Green, pale green horse, meaning? Death. So kind of that pale green color of death. So the first four then having to do with an afflicting what? The whole earth. We see that number four again. Uh, fifth seal. Now things change. We see the picture of the martyrs underneath the the altar. Yep, the altar by the you know in the in heaven. Uh, meaning, yeah, persecution. Remember we talked about that. Really emphasized that. Uh, sixth seal. Earthquake, darkness. That last final judgment. Of course, that sixth seal would be. And really, the fifth seal, too, would be expounded upon, and we find out way more later on, as we'll see. Uh, and then the seventh seal overlaps into seven trumpets. Uh, summarize the overall message. Hey, Ron. Summarize the overall message of the seven seals in one or two sentences. Trying to keep that big picture view of each of these visions. Okay, wake up call to the sinners. What's the whole purpose? Repentance. So it starts with the gospel. All these messages meant to point to that as it's being proclaimed. Anyone else? Anything else there? Shows what will happen to the earth itself. So the battle on the earth. So it's on the earth. Everything that's going on here, right? And all of earth is being affected by all this. Good. What else? Jody? will continue. Are we ever going to reach utopia? Okay, in heaven. Right, yeah, but not in this earth, not in the New Testament era. Uh, even though Christ has won the victory, this New Testament era for us, anybody is going to be filled with difficulties. Good. What else? Good, let's go on to the next one. We've got the seven trumpets now. First trumpet. Hail and fire. <coughs> Meaning. Yeah, we talked about hail too with the bowl that we'll see coming up, uh, that we hear the worksheet that we'll see coming up that we looked at last week. Uh, so yeah, hail fire is that judgment. And you said, Fran? What? So thrown onto the earth. That once again have the earth being affected here. Uh, second trumpet. Turn the sea into blood. Now the sea is being turned into blood. So I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, a third of the sea now. Keep in mind the third. Uh, meaning. Yeah, so maybe here uh, some emphasis on the sea as we see different parts being affected. We see disaster as a key word there. See how this reflects also what we just saw in the seals. See, once again, blood the color red as well. Third trumpet. Rivers and the streams, the water becomes poisonous. So now not just the sea, but even those inland waters that people would drink. partake of and drink. Meaning? Very similar to what we see with the bowls, isn't it? People can just hide from being away from the sea, like wherever they go over to It will affect everybody. Again, we've got a sign, each of these signs is meant to lead to what? 
Repentance. Repentance. And so every, everything's being affected here. Uh, fourth trumpet. Now the, the sun, moon, and stars are being turned dark, uh, so now we've got things up there in the heavens being affected. Once again, one, two, three, four. All of creation here facing something. Now, meaning. What's that? No escape. No escape. You think of everything that could be emphasized there. <coughs> Sun, moon, and stars are really everywhere around the earth, above the earth, aren't they? Once again, God's judgment we see highlighted here. Fifth trumpet. Now we start to, this is kind of where we start to realize, oh, okay, this set now is focusing on what? Especially so. Spiritual, Spiritual plagues that are affecting. So that all of these, even, even one through four, trumpets one through four, remember how we talked about, there seems to be a different emphasis now. So now even we see the, the devil coming out of the abyss. Sixth trumpet. On death to, to millions you said angels on horseback why do you say angels on horseback demonic army. it would be it would be more the demonic army the the, yeah. the demon army and sorry I missed it earlier is a big part of it too uh, when the abyss was opened what came out locusts, locusts. And, and the meaning for that all of that the fifth trumpet Demons, the devil and demons and, and all their demonic teachings, their false teachings. Uh, sixth trumpet, similar thing. As you see it now is getting ramped up. We've got 200 million soldiers now going out and affect, affecting and afflicting people. Anything else with the first six trumpets? All right, the seventh trumpet. Overlaps in two. Yeah, into the next visions, as we'll see. Uh, hold on to that, though. Uh, summarize the overall message of the seven trumpets in one or two sentences. Okay, more wake-up call to repent, especially as it affects what? The spiritual kind of realm. And we see the, the demonic influences there. What else did you have? One or two sentences. False teaching permeates the world. False teaching permeates the world. Good use of the word permeates. Teacher. <laughs> it's intensifying compared to the, the seals. So the seals, and now we see it even ramped up a little bit, don't we? Uh, you think about how terrible the seals were, and yet you see these descriptions of the locusts and this, these nasty armies coming at you. Yeah, it's intensified. The pictures got me even scarier. What are their emphases? All right, seven visions then. Uh, here it's a little bit different to remember, and I kind of delineated where we are with each of those. What was the first vision? We get this woman. <coughs> you know, even there in the Bible, the, the chapter says the dragon and the child. You can understand why that's, that's the heading. Really, the heading could be the woman, right? You see the major part of this. So the first vision is the woman, but who's going after the woman? You said Satan. Here it's the dragon, but yeah, uh, the meaning would be the Satan. Would be Satan. Uh, what's the meaning overall of this first vision then? So we're, we're including, keep in mind, those first six verses along with the war in heaven and along with the persecution. Uh, give me 
kind of each of them. Do you remember all right, what was verses one through six? The emphasis was. Not quite yet. So the woman is the church. But the devil trying to stop the fulfillment of, of the coming of the Savior. And then also there at the end what, what Jesus did, which is then also emphasized in verses 7 through 12. What were 7 through 12? A highlight of Yeah, in which realm again? In heaven, we talked about. Now this is the spiritual realm, if you remember that. And when did this war take place? It wasn't much of a war, by the way. We talked about how that's really seen uh, Jesus dying on the cross, uh, verses 10 and 11. The accuser of the brother of our brothers has been thrown down. We talked about how that happened. When Jesus paid for sin. Verse 11, they conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and so on. So, war in heaven won on the cross. He said, it's finished with the gospel. Then the next, uh, the dragon persecutes the woman. What's the emphasis there? Now he turns, go ahead, Joey. Now he's going after the church. So he went after Christ and tried to stop him, couldn't. Now he goes after the church. How did that go? Not too well. And so then he decides to do what? I'm going to go after individuals then. That's where that kind of vision he's off. All right, first vision is a big one. Second vision. Beast of the sea, which represents what? The meaning of? <coughs> huh? the world. Yeah, what part of the world is emphasized? <laughs> Touche. Which evil part? <laughs> yeah, secular government. So secular, in terms of secular government and its anti-Christian aspects. Right? So always keep that in mind. I don't want the government seeing these live streams and saying we're going to revolt or anything like that. No. Uh, this is the anti-Christian parts of secular government. So the beast from the sea. Keep this in mind, by the way. All of chapter 13. A lot of this imagery will come back up again tonight. Uh, the third vision. Beast of the earth, who is the what? <coughs> Yeah, the false prophet, who is that? The capital A Antichrist. So now we have this particular person here, this beast. Notice uh, the different parts of what the beast is able to do. What was emphasized of what the beast was able to do, this beast? Make a special. A lot of miracles, so counterfeit miracles. The whole point is to pull people away from Jesus. All right, fourth vision. Now we get to 12 times 12 times 1,000, 144,000 once again. And there's the lamb with them. Uh, the meaning. Those who have been saved. And there they are saved with Christ. So even though these beasts permeate, and their power does as well, the whole earth, Christ and his people, Christ will save his people. Fifth vision, 6 through 13. Three angels. Remember what we talked about with the three angels. Yeah. 
So they're announcing what's to come, right? The especially the impending judgments. What else? So there's the gospel. So we kind of, you know, have the word of God emphasized there, especially we've got some judgment that's proclaimed. Also some, some comfort. Things, you know, fear God and give him glory. Worship him. That word that goes out. Also that comfort towards the end. Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Sixth vision. Yeah, what's that all about? The harvest here. Is that what you say, Ron? Yeah. Okay. We get this harvest. Keep in mind, we've got two harvests here. You remember? First, what's harvested? With a sickle, what do you harvest? Grain. There's the wheat. But then also, what happens at the second harvest? Souls. So, in other places, it's the chaff. Here, it's the, the grapes. And the grapes get trampled. So, we see that 16,000 stadia or 1,600 stadia that we talked about. So, the trampling and the wine press of God's wrath. The seventh vision overlaps into into the bowls. And the transition to the next set emphasizes. Do you remember this? Specifically, what about them? Look at verse 1. But we have this whole, really, all verse 1 through 8. But this is a long intro now. Yeah, the very last part of it, right? So the fact that they're the last plague, maybe that's what you're going for, Frank. But the fact that this is the end. Here comes the final judgment that's pictured. So this transition is a little bit different. It's longer, it's emphasized more, and this last idea, remember, comes out more and more. What's happening in that room? <laughs> Crazier than Revelation, maybe. All right, summarize, summarize the overall message of the seven visions in one or two sentences. <laughs> And there's a reason it's one or two sentences. Condense it, get general here. Jesus' return as the ultimate king. Good one. Give me another one. Was it the point the point Coming up here, well, repentance won't be mentioned, I think, after the fifth bowl. Okay. Yep. But. The fact that it's the last judgment in the next one, yeah, in a way, it kind of is emphasized there, too. The overall message, though, what do we have? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the devil's raging so he said more and more, God said to me off. <laughs> well, he, Here comes the final judgment. All right. But she, if you couldn't hear, she said the devil ri raises, raises his head. Yeah, he's, he's raging the devil's head more and more. And that's it, enough. enough. And then comes the final judgment. I like that you had an ugly hair. Oh, yeah. All right, next question. What overall difference or change do you see in this set of seven in comparison with the previous sets of seven, the seals and the trumpets? What overall difference or change do you see in this set? The substance of the end times, it says. What other all, what other difference or change do you see? Increase, uh, increase in 
Kind of an emphasis a lot on persecution, wasn't it? Yep. A lot more comfort here than the earlier ones, especially with the victory that we have in Christ and the, and the interjections here and there with praise. And the other one is kind of just general judgments. Now we're really getting into these are specific players in this, right? Uh, the secular government, the Antichrist. Okay. Now you can kind of see why this that set of seven is a little bit different in terms of how it's portrayed in Revelation. A little bit different. All right, then the seven bowls. First bowl. Okay, uh, so there it is on the land again. So bowl upon the earth. Then what happens? Painful swords. The meaning? Remember we talked about uh, a little bit of, you know, some guesses. Is this the conscience that really is, is weighed down and bothered? Uh, that can be one of the more painful Things. Again, we don't want to get too bogged down in the details, but that's just one thing that has been offered. Uh, second bowl. <coughs> Out of the sea, now every living creature dies. Now, what's the difference there? What was it before? One third, and now it's every. So here again, final is emphasized. Uh, third bowl. Rivers and fountains of water again. Again, what what is affected now? It's it's everything and everybody. Water. Water's turned into blood. We had talked about how the the water of life might be an option here for some of the meaning, and how that's it's gone now. It's done. Final judgment. Fourth bowl. Poured out on the. On the sun, what happened? People were burned. Remember what we talked about a possible meaning? People used to What's that? They were scorched. And so possible meaning with that? The sun was scorching them when people oftentimes as they were worship. Worshipping false gods. So maybe like false gods idea and kind of getting burned by them in a sense. But again, just a guess and not, nothing definitive there. Fifth bowl went down deep. Darkened the throne of the beast. Throne of the beast and darkened the kingdom. And so now we have what emphasize? What meaning? Okay, now the gospel, all that completely gone. Uh, those who trusted in that government now is their complete darkness. Sixth bowl. Battle of Har Megiddo, Mountain of Megiddo. What was the meaning there? <coughs> God's going to triumph. God's going to triumph. Jody? Deliverance. Deliverance. So, you know, it's not going to be much of a battle. It wasn't much of a battle, was it? Same thing as it wasn't much of a battle at the Battle of Megiddo there that we talked about last week. And then the seventh bowl. It was on the air. On the air, the final part, and now it's the end. That's it. This one doesn't spill over into another seven. That's it. End of the world. The last plagues truly does. Boom. End of the sevens. That doesn't mean it's the end of Revelation. As we'll see now in 17 through 19 tonight, we get more information then on what we just reviewed there. Uh, but before we do that, summarize the overall message of the seven. Oops. It says visions. It should be bowls. 
in one or two sentences. God's wrath is complete. Judgment day has come. I wish you guys could see Karen's face as she gives these <laughs> one or two sentences. The colorfulness of her words is showing up here. Makes any expression. All right, what special emphasis do you see in this set of seven? We talked about that. If this is the Final judgment. This is the end. And this is the last set of seven. Why do you think that is? End of the world. Was that helpful for a review? Yeah, that, boy, we've covered a lot, huh? By the way, I looked at it uh, up until tonight. There's 367 slides in this Google Slides. I think Google hates me for just this. Uh, this set of slides might take up its own server, I wonder. Um, there's a lot going on. So now, as we take a look, what I first I want you to do before we dive into tonight, look at verse 16, 19. Revelation 16, 19. It's page 1805. <coughs> says, and the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. Babylon the great was remembered by God, and he gave her the wine cup filled with his fierce wrath. The reason I highlight that is basically what we have now, along with the judgment that comes after that in those couple of verses. What we have in 17 and 18 is kind of uh, more information on that verse. What is this Babylon the Great? What is this meant? Uh, we'll see a lot of the pictures that we've already seen in Revelation will also come to play here. But chapter 17 identifies now this prostitute that we're going to meet. Chapter 18 predicts her downfall and destruction. And then chapter 19 is the victory song of the saints. What we're going to cover for the rest of tonight is chapter 17. So this identifies the prostitute. This gives us a lot of information on the prostitute. <clears throat> However, I apologize. We won't fully identify the Antichrist until next week. <coughs> Again, don't ruin it, if you know. Uh, don't ruin it. But as things come, you know, let's think about maybe where this might be leading. As scripture leads you to that. Let's go right to the commentary there, those first two paragraphs. In these chapters, judgment comes upon the anti-Christian kingdom, which is described as a harlot and as a great city called Babylon. Revelation 7.18 shows us that these two are essentially the same. So at the end of the chapter, it says a prostitute is the great city. So two pictures, same thing. The Bible says that there will be many antichrists and one great antichrist, capital A. They will, fall, they will all fall together when Christ appears at the last judgment and all anti-Christian power collapses. These chapters direct our attention especially to the antichrist who displays and practices anti-Christian power in a special way. This description of antichrist is given for a purpose. It helps us identify his kingdom so we can separate ourselves from it and escape being condemned with it, as will be said in chapter 18. So these, all of these things are meant to help us identify them. Uh, back in John's day, a lot of this would have been like, what? And kind of over their heads. Uh, now you and I can look back at history and see, okay, this is what was being communicated. Uh, but we'll see that later. Now, uh, as we see this prostitute here, just keep in mind, this is not talking about the act of physical adultery or an actual prostitute when it comes to physical sexual adultery. This is talking about what kind of adultery? Spiritual, spiritual adultery. Or even take a, a big look at a big picture about that in Scripture. 
So spiritual adultery is being emphasized here. So first, let's read it, and I think let's, tonight, let's just read, it says read chapters 17 and 18, let's just read chapter 17. So can I get two readers, one for 1 through 8, and then 1 through 9 through 18? Helen wants 1 through 8, 9 through 18? Mark, go for it. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke to me. He said... Come, I will show you the judgment on the great prostitute who is sitting at many waters. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and those who make their home on the earth have become drunk on the waters of her immortality. The angel carried me in spirit into a wilderness, and they saw a woman sitting at a scarlet beach that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed with purple and scarlet, and was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. In her hand was a gold cup full of ab abominations and the fil filth of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead this name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of the prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw that this woman was drunk from the blood of the saints and the blood of Jesus' martyrs. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed, and the angel said to me, Why are you amazed? I will tell you the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carries her, the one that has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw, he existed, is no more, and he is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. Those who make their home on the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be amazed when they see the beast, because he existed, is no more, and will exist again. A mind that has wisdom is needed here. Seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman is sitting. There are also seven kings. By the fallen one is, and the other has not yet come. But when he comes, he must be made for a little while. The beast that existed and is no more is the eighth king who is one of the seven and is going to go to destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but along with the beast they will receive authority like kings for one hour. They share one purpose, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Those who are with him are the call, the elect, and the believers. The angel also said to me, The waters that you saw, where the prostitute is sitting, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The ten horns are the beast. The ten horns and the beast that you saw will hate the prostitute and will cause her to be abandoned and naked. They will also eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, namely, to agree to give their royal authority to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. You know, I changed my mind. I think, is there any commentary needed? <laughs> A joke doesn't get old for me. But I don't think it will. A lot here, huh? Let's dive in. First of all, notice the similarities. Compare this woman to the woman we saw in chapter 12. What do you notice? First of all, it's a... It's a woman. Okay, that shouldn't escape your notice. What else? Okay, so we'll talk about the, the prostituting aspect, but a servant of the beast in a way, she's actually sitting on the beast, and so we see this allegiance and this adultery really kind of going on, uh, but even just then, just go first back to the, the fact that we see a woman, where is she? She is sitting on the peoples, on the many waters. No, what, what location? Where was he taken to? Babylon. No. She is Babylon. She's taken to the wilderness. What do you remember about chapter 12? 
the woman was taken into the wilderness. But now we see, so that both women, both in the wilderness, and so we see this matchy-matchy kind of a thing, and yet, obviously, a very different description, isn't it? And so something's going on here. But we see this almost a replication, but in a, just a really terrible way. It's like, what is being emphasized then is some, you know, something within the church then has been adulterated. Okay, we have this kind of connection. Now, how this has been pictured there, as you can kind of see, here's one example. Uh, the beasts down there, you see all the different horns that they can have. A couple of them have two, because there's ten horns. Here are some other representations of the prostitute on the beast. Uh, lots of different. If you go online, you can check out a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, you can see the wine cup of gold emphasized there. Really the biggest difference with this is really the beast. <laughs> How people in, uh, imagine the beast. We've got kind of a dragon there. I'm sorry, a, a dinosaur, a dragon here. We've got a leopard there. You know, we've got all these this different mix, almost like lionish here, but different interpretations. Um, what's the color? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Sorry. I want to just kind of take those in. Kind of interesting how some of the pictures, too, with the cup kind of holding it up. Because she's what? He's drunk. So kind of how they picture that as well. All right, let's go to the text then. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls, or that connection then to that seventh bull that we just talked about in verse 19 from last chapter. It says, Come, I will show you the judgment on the great prostitute who is sitting on many waters. More on that in a little bit. Kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her. So who is she? Who is she aligned with and adulterated herself with? The governments of the earth. The kings of the earth. So we have here a picture of what? A fuller picture of what we saw in chapter thirteen. We saw the beast of the sea. We saw the beast of the earth, and now we see them pictured in different ways, but it's the same thing. And now, especially, we see that connection. That is there with them. She's committed sexual immorality with the beasts. With the beast. So the, the kings have become drunk on the wine of him of her immorality as well. So we see kind of an allegiance there. Notice the similar verse three, the, the similar description of the woman, I'm sorry, of the beast here and the beast of the sea in chapter 13. Seven heads, ten horns, just like before. What do we talk about with the seven heads, ten horns? Why seven? Completeness. Kind of this completeness idea, but it kind of trying to match and mimic what? God in a lot of ways. And with the ten horns again, that power, but also we'll get more information on the horns later, but this kind of, this completeness type of idea as well. Uh, so we get seven heads, ten horns um, being thrown at us. Uh, with the blasphemous names all over the beast, what does that show you about the beast and the woman? Their hatred for God. The flat out hatred going against and blaspheming what God says. When you think blasphemy, it's going against something that God has said, especially about who he is. So we have this blasphemous names, and we'll, we'll cover a little bit more of that blasphemy in a second. Verses 4 through 6, then, we get some interesting descriptions here. Now, my question is, what do each of these verses tell you about the prostitute? Well, first, we have a woman was clothed with purple and scarlet and was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Why purple? Don't say Vikings, Ron. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, it's the color of royalty. It is. It's this royal color. And so what else do we see with these jewels, these fine pearls? This she is rich, rich, wealthy. So whatever she's doing has gained her great wealth. Okay. We also see scarlet. Why is that important? 
what color was the dragon in chapter 12? Red. Dragon was red. So we have this. She has fully taken on now the color of the one that she's really adulterated with. So you think of this uh, this idea of the fact that she's taken this on and let herself conform to the, the dragon. This kind of brings to mind Romans 12. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. So you see the opposite has happened here now. She's fully conformed now to the, the image of the world that the devil wants. What's her name in verse 5? Forehead, the very first thing is mystery. This is not a coincidence. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians, as we'll take a look at next week in depth, talks about this Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, he calls him. And he says this. In fact, the mystery of this lawlessness is already at work. At work but only until the one who is now holding him back moves out of the way. And this is right in the middle of a whole section about the Antichrist. So this mystery, it's, it's being hidden, is really what the word is. So it, it's hard to see, it's, very, it's being hidden, especially in Paul's day and in John's day. It's this kind of this mystery thing. They knew this Antichrist was coming. Who is this going to be? It was kind of hidden in a mystery to them. So kind of a shout out to, you know, in some ways there to 2 Thessalonians. Babylon the Great, why Babylon? Opposition. Opposition to God, we have an enemy of God's people. Pictured once again, we've seen this Babylon previously in, in the other chapters. The mother of the prostitutes, so are there other prostitutes? Yes, are there other anti-Christian forces? Yes, this is the biggest, really worst one. And of the abominations of the earth, how does God feel about this prostitute? What she does? Abomination. Came up with that again on Sunday, abomination nation. That's what we looked at, how God is holy, the nation was, was not. Verse 6, I, I saw this woman was drunk from the blood of the saints and the blood of Jesus' martyrs. What does this tell us about the woman? Murdering. Murdering who? Christians. Christians. She murders Christians. She persecutes and kills them, makes them martyrs. So not only is she within the church, she persecutes God's true people. That in mind. Verse 7, uh, we see this. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. The angel said to me, why are you amazed? I tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her and so on. Why, why was John amazed, do you think? He sees the woman. He says, wait a second. I just saw her. A very similar woman, but now this woman is with the beast. You kind of see, like, I don't understand. How could that be? Even within the church, it kind of seems to be to be amazed. And the angel says, "Let me explain this to you," and then goes into it. Verse eight, kind of said, "How does this happen?" Uh, I'm sorry, in the verse. Seven, uh, we see the one who has seven heads and ten horns. That leads us into verse eight. The beast that you saw, he existed, is no more, and he is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. Wait, what? How does that make sense? Why does it say that? He was, is not, and yet he'll come again. <clears throat> what does that sound like? Where do you see that pattern? We've seen it before in Revelation a couple of times. Okay, 
Okay, so he had the wound, but it was later healed, right? The wound that had been healed? Yes, and we'll come up to that in a little bit too on that. But this specific pattern here, who was, is, and is to come. Where have we heard that? Who is that describing? That's actually talking about God and Jesus. And so what do we see here? Pattern describing this. Who was, is not, and yet will come. We see a similar pattern. Once again, who is this trying to be? This beast is trying to take the place of God and of Christ. Will not succeed. Is not, but will come again. So we kind of see again this kind of play on words here. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings, and the, four, the wings were full of eyes all around and underneath. Day and night without pause, they kept saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is coming. And now this beast, once again, trying to take the place of God, but cannot. Verse 8b, so the second half of verse 8. It says, those who make their home on earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life and the creation of the world, will be amazed when they see this beast, because he existed as no more and is no more and will exist again. Hey, we really like that this thing is taking the place of God. Who are these people? Unbelievers, Unbelievers yeah. Especially those who don't want God, who reject him, they're going to replace him. With, they're always going to replace him with something else. Those who say they don't believe in God, they always replace it. All right, continuing on. Verse 9, we get more information about this beast and this woman. Verse 9, a mind that has wisdom is needed here. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is sitting. There are also seven kings. Why seven hills? Yeah, what was called and known as the city on, of seven hills? Rome. Rome. So here we have, oops, what is that? Oh, I had another verse there. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.4. I did. So just uh, an example of trying to take the place of God there too. But moving on. Uh, seven hills, so if you, if you take a look, Rome was built and exists on seven different hills. You can see them outlined there. It was always known as the city of seven hills, the city of seven hills. People in John's day, when they hear seven hills, what would they have thought of right away? Rome. So this is a, a clear picture of that this prostitute now, this takes wisdom, he said, she's sitting on seven hills. So coming from Rome. So look for the Antichrist, especially in Rome, is what is John is trying to communicate to you. Verse 10 it gets even more interesting. Five of these kings have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. But when he comes, he must remain for a little while. We can identify these five kings, most likely, when we have these kings that are setting themselves up over and against God. The five fallen kings, the first one would then be Egypt. Where do we see that? Nation trying to go up against God? Exodus. Exodus. And what happened? Got, to, got defeated. Okay? But yet again, what came next later on? Another enemy of God's people, Assyria. What happened to them? Went down again, so it was not. And yet, we'll come again. Who was this next one? Babylon. Babylon. What happened to that one? Went down to the, down to the knees of Persians. Went down again. The next one, Persia, set itself up against God. Sadly, even if it wasn't for Mordecai and Esther, once again would have prevailed. And yet, God eventually brought them down. Raised up again. Greece, kingdom of Alexander. We have Antiochus Epiphanes. Later on came and, and tried to wipe out and destroy all worship of, of the Jews in Jerusalem. And yet, whew, defeated yet again. 
Now in John's day, who is the king, the king that is? Rome. Rome. The king who is to come, we will identify later, it's connected with Daniel 7. So you see how this then is kind of exactly what we've been talking about with who was, once, uh, is not, but now will come again from the abyss. And then go to destruction. We see this pattern with all these five kings. Questions on that? All right, next one, go to verse 11 then. Now we hear that the beast that existed and is no more is the eighth king, who is one of the seven and is going to go to destruction. So he's, he existed, he's no more, and he's going to destruction. This then, Jody, highlights that fatal wound that had been healed. So, but it's not all, it's, it's uh, always healed and then an enemy of the church rises again. Continuing on, verse 12. The ten horns you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but along with the beast they will receive authority like kings for one hour. What was the number of ten again? Completeness. And so we have here probably highlight, don't try to identify each of these ten kings for this one. This is probably talking about right here in the complete New Testament era, what's going to happen? There's going to be another king that rises, rules for short time, one hour, and then another one. And another one. So again, an emphasis of, is this ever going to stop in the New Testament era? No, we'll have to be facing this type of a thing. This whole allegiance, the, the secular government going against Christianity a lot. Another highlight there. Continuing on, verses 13 to 14. Uh, this is a great one. Uh, this little interjection here. They share one purpose, that they give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but... The Lamb will overcome them because He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Those who are with Him are the called, the elect, and the believing. Why this interjection? It does, doesn't it? When you read this description, you're like, oh boy, who can even stand up against this? This beast, it's going to continue, really, for the whole New Testament era? And yet the overall message of Revelation is what? Jesus wins. He's the King of Kings, Lord of Life. Don't fear. There's hope. Jesus is the true King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so here, kind of this interjection highlights. Do it again. There we go. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. So that, that promise that Jesus Christ will defeat. Whatever allies of Satan and hell that there are, he is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Continuing to zoom through, verse 15. The angel also said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is sitting are the people's multitudes, nations, and languages. Now we're here, Mark. Yeah. What does this highlight? This is highlighting the fact that she here she's controlling the the beast and the woman are controlling the whole world. So we have the whole influence across the whole world. And so this isn't just in one little location, maybe there in Jerusalem or just out in the wilderness. No, she's on the many waters highlighted by the people's languages of the whole world. The wide world government. So we have also not just the fact that she's in the whole world, but you kind of get this picture here of kind of an outnumbering. Like this is a, an overwhelming influence. In a lot of ways. So you're not going to really escape this, or you, you will be affected by this. Now take a look at verse 16. It sounds weird when you first read it. The ten horns and the beast that you saw will hate the prostitute. It will cause her to be abandoned and naked. They also eat her flesh and burn her with fire. What's going to happen? 
the beast is going to turn on her. Turn on her. And now oppose her. So it's kind of interesting now. What I want you to do in your Bibles real quick. Go to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. Page 1251. <clears throat> What's the headline? Jerusalem. Jerusalem the prostitute. Jerusalem is going to prostitute herself with other kingdoms. Where do you think? John and Revelation in the vision, where do you think it's borrowed from? Exactly right here, Ezekiel 16. As you go through it, uh, we'll just scan through the first part here. Uh, God talked about seeing Jerusalem. You know, I saw your origin and your birth. You were kind of from this nation, this nation. But hey, take a look at what I did. I had pity. I, I extended the robe of, of my robe over you, basically. Uh, made you my wife. And yet... Uh, let's flip the page. Look at all these things. I adorned you. I did all these amazing things for you. Look at verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty, relying on your fame. You acted like a prostitute. And so on. This description of this prostitute and what they did. Uh, now look, go down to verse 27. Look at how I stretched my hand against you. I reduced your territory. I gave you up to the desire of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who were embarrassed by your lewd acts. You acted like a whore with the sons of the Assyrians. You were insatiable, and so on. All the way down, it says, So you extended your whoring ways to the land of merchants to Chaldea. What's that? Babylon. That's Babylon. So here we have prostituting, God's people prostituting themselves with the unbelieving nations of the world. This is exactly what's being pictured in Revelation 17. Mark? Verse 20, you even took your sons and your daughters, who you bore for me, and sacrificed them as food for the idols. And talking about really the sacrifices to Moloch, right there, and so modern day application of the abortion. Take a look, uh, though, uh, look at verses especially verses 35 to 42. Therefore, you whore, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Because your moisture was poured out and your nakedness was exposed during your whoring ways with your lovers, because of all your disgusting, filthy idols and because of the blood of your children whom you gave to them, for all this I am about to gather all your lovers to whom you were, going, you were giving pleasure, all those you loved, as well as all those you hated. I will gather them against you from all around. I will expose your nakedness to them, and they will see your nakedness. I will judge you with the judgments deserved by women who commit adultery and who shed blood. I will make you bloody in my wrath and jealousy. I will deliver you into their hands, and they will tear down your platform, demolish your pavilion, strip you of your clothing, take away your glorious jewelry, and leave you completely naked. Where did we just hear that revelation? Hopefully nobody's just joining the live stream there. We just heard that about how they would strip the prostitute of the Babylon of Babylon the Great. And then verse 40 to burn down the houses of fire. That's 41, sorry. So there's more there. If you'd like to explore Ezekiel 16, you can kind of see the background of Revelation 17. But let's go back to 17. All of that borrowed imagery once again from the Old Testament. Now go to verse 17 and 18. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, namely to agree to give their royal authority to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Why would he say this? Right there. He's still in charge. Despite what you see here, despite what happens, 
and even the turning back and, and turning against the prostitute, God is still in charge and he's still the one using it for what? The purpose of fulfilling his word. Why is that a great comfort for you and me today? Well said. Everybody hear her? Yeah. So there we have this great comfort once again. We see this in Revelation, don't we? We see all these terrible things happening, and then an interjection that says, God's in charge. He's going to win. He's got this. It's like God is repeating this to try to communicate something to us. Maybe we take another word. And then wrapping it up, verse 18 there, the woman whom you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So, once again, who's the great city that rules over the kings of the earth? In John's day? Rome. Rome. Rome is the, that great city communicated there. She is that city. Once again, identifying it with Rome. And we will... So there we are laying the foundation for what we'll talk about next week with the Antichrist. What we'll do next week is we'll kind of review a little bit of this in 17. We'll take a look at chapter 18 then. We'll actually skip 19, go through and, and identify the Antichrist, and then go back to chapter 19, which is the victory song over the prostitute, Babylon the Great, and so on. No, uh, then we get some really good stuff after we get through this lesson. Then we get to the New Jerusalem. You're taking a break over. But we are. So uh, next week, we're gonna, after next week, we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks. So one more week. Whew, that was a chapter. I know it was a lot to try to take in and all the imagery. Uh, again, hopefully it's just the foundation for what we'll take a look at further next week. Any questions? First one say makes a lot more sense now in uh, on chapter 16 and verse uh, 19 where it says uh, that one the great was remembered by God and he gave her a blind cup filled with his beautiful. So that makes a lot more sense when they expand it. He expounds it. Yeah. Yep. What does that mean? Well, let's read the next chapter, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, let's say a prayer. Lord God, it can be difficult for us to read these things in Scripture that talk about these great forces of evil. It can even be more difficult for us to live in among them and around them. We ask that you keep us strong, keep us faithful, keep us believing in you so that we can stand on the last day and see your great wrath against your enemies and rejoice and praise you for your work, not just in your justice, but especially in your gospel, saving us from your wrath. Lord, guide us closer to Christ, especially as we see the great miracle of the Incarnation at Christmas, and continue to build us up in Him and His grace, which is the only reason that we will stand. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a week. <coughs> Oh, that's a terrible